Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Um, could I ask everybody in the public gallery to switch off any electronic devices um, so that it doesn't interfere with the committee's work? Um, Monica Lennon is not able to attend and sends her apologies. Um, item one is to take uh, item three in private. Are committee members agreed? Thank you. Item two is Scotland's Colleges 2017, and we'll now take evidence on the Auditor General's report. Can I welcome to the meeting this morning Paul Johnson, who's Director General of Education, Communities and Justice, and Aileen McKechnie, who's Director of Advanced Learning and Science, both from the Scottish Government, um, Dr John Kemp, who's the Interim Chief Executive of the Scottish Funding Council, and finally Shona Struthers, who's Chief Executive of Colleges Scotland. Welcome to you all. Now, I understand you would like to make a brief, em I emphasise brief, um, opening statement um, and could I invite Shona to perhaps go first. Thank you very much. Um, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to present evidence to the committee today on behalf of College of Scotland representing the college sector. I think the Audit Scotland report demonstrates that colleges continue to be great places to learn and their focus on education provision and innovation and the benefits that this brings to Scotland's wider economic ambitions is recognised and valued by all. It highlights that colleges remain at the heart of a world-class education sector and that they deliver the right education and skills in the right place at the right time. It is encouraging that the report recognises that most college students are satisfied with their experience and go on to further study, training or employment. And whilst colleges continue to meet the Scottish Government target of 116,000 full-time equivalents to deliver training, learning. The sector is also playing a part in helping to, helping to close the attainment gap. And we are pleased that the report notes that attainment in colleges has improved over the last year. We acknowledge that the report highlights some of the challenges facing the sector. As noted in the written evidence, the news comes as little surprise as the 2016 Audit Scotland report highlighted, a growing number of colleges face financial challenges, and the college accounts published in April 17 confirm this. We appreciate the Scottish Government's additional funding made available in 1718, which recognises the circumstances that the sector faces, but the overall number of colleges forecasting deficits is increasing, and we continue to voice our concerns that this is not a sustainable situation. We agree with the report that national bargaining is a significant financial challenge for the colleges and without additional resource year on year, the ongoing costs are not affordable for the sector, without impacting severely on quality and or the student experience. However, colleges continue to manage their finances well and the pressures highlighted in the report reflect tighter public finances, changes in accounting rules and increased cost pressures out with the control of colleges. Most colleges are operating at a, e a near break-even position and all our colleges continue to be well managed and remain resilient in difficult financial circumstances. Nevertheless, we are focused on moving forward and we continue to deliver on the key Scottish Government policy drivers. We continue to work with the Scottish Government and the Scottish Funding Council to understand student demand and to develop long-term financial plans, as well as ensure sustainable funding for the sector and we manage the cost pressures. As a sector, we need to ensure that college education continues to be available to all and that colleges working with employers continue to deliver the skilled workforce needed in our modern economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr Kemp. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the Auditor General's report. As you will see from um, my letter to the committee, we've accepted the recommendations of the report. Um, it's to the great credit of the college sector that it's continued to deliver well against our shared ambitions. For example, it continues to meet the 116,000 FTE target for volume of teaching. Student satisfaction um, is at 90%. There is very good representation in colleges um, from students from deprived postcodes and by disability, ethnicity and gender. There's been a steady increase in the number of learners articulating from college to university with advanced standing. There's been a strong trend for improved success rates for students achieving recognised qualifications. The vast majority of college leavers were in a positive destination six months after graduating. 
And the number of senior phase pupils studying vocational qualifications as part of the DYW programme delivered by colleges has increased and further growth um, is projected. But as I made clear in my submission, the college sector faces significant challenges, um, including continuing to improve retention, the implementation of national bargaining and improving financial planning and financial health. We will continue to work with the college sector and the government to address these challenges and the report's recommendations. And I'm very happy to answer your questions on how we will do so. Thank you very much. Paul Johnson. Thank you for the opportunity to provide evidence to the committee in response to the Auditor General for Scotland's report on Scotland's Colleges 2017. As the Director General for Education, Communities and Justice, I am the relevant accountable officer for the Scottish Government. I have responsibility for ensuring that the Scottish Funding Council's strategic direction aligns with the priorities of the Scottish Government and that it has the necessary controls in place to safeguard public funds. The accountable officer for the Scottish Funding Council is Dr John Kemp and the Scottish Funding Council is accountable for the delivery of the Scottish Government's policy objectives, uh, for the deployment of resources to deliver these and for associated planning and management of risk. I too welcome the report Scotland's Colleges 2017. It highlights what is working, where ongoing work should be concluded and where further improvement should be made. Colleges have a clear, focused role in delivering a skilled workforce for their regions, and they have developed new and enhanced relationships with employers around curriculum planning, work experience and employability skills. Their focus is on learning opportunities that lead to recognised qualifications and employment. We're pleased that the report identifies that the sector has continued to exceed the national target for learning and that student attainment has improved. And we're working to improve performance further. In that regard, the Minister for Further Education, Higher Education and Science has announced a national college improvement programme to raise attainment and improve retention in Scotland's colleges over the next two academic years. The report also identifies that the financial health of the college sector is relatively stable and that total Scottish Government funding to the sector will increase by 5% between 1516 and 1718. Negotiations on national bargaining remain ongoing, therefore the full costs have still to be determined, but these costs will be considered carefully as part of the future budget settlement. On student headcount, official figures from the Scottish Funding Council show a small increase in headcount from the year 1415 to the year 1516. We've also seen an increase in the numbers of students studying from areas of deprivation. At least 83% of students who achieve a qualification go on to a positive destination, such as further study, training or employment. Colleges are not only delivering for our young people. The number of full-time students aged 25 or over has increased by more than 12% since the year 11-12. Colleges are also playing a key role in the delivery of higher education. Over 41% of all full-time college activity in 2015-16 was in higher education, which was the highest proportion ever. So there are a lot of successes that all those working and studying in the sector can be proud of. However, we recognise the challenges identified within the report and will continue to work closely with the Scottish Funding Council, Colleges Scotland and individual colleges on the report's findings and will work to address the, the recommendations that are for the Scottish Government. Thank you all very much for your opening statements. We'll move straight to questions and Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to explore one or two issues around about budgets, which uh, are obviously a, a major thing. Um, I'm looking at uh, the number of people employed by colleges. They've increased by 6% over the last two years, and yet the pretty well every college has had a voluntary severance scheme. What does that 6% represent? I mean, are they cleaners? Are they lecturers? And, you know, you, you have a business case for each severance person that's going through a severance programme. 
how does it, how does this work? You're hiring people and getting rid of people. Colin, can I start on that? Um, what what we've seen over the last few years um, is an increase in staff, both on support and on lecturing. In support staff, uh, some of that is down to uh, services having been brought in house. For example, it used to be outsourced, like catering. It's also as a result of some curriculum changes and the employment of more apprenticeships, apprentices. So, in, and also on the lecturing side, we see a genuine increase in activity, um, as well as a change in the curriculum. So, it's more to do with changes that are happening currently and working more with employers. We've seen that requiring an increase in staff. I mean, uh you're talking about bringing services in-house. Presumably there's a business case for each of these. Yeah. Yeah. Does it go to SFC? A contract for bringing something in-house wouldn't come to us. No. It wouldn't? No. It, it would sit with the college and the college governance structure on a cost-benefit basis. But we're confident that in every case there is a, there is a, a cost-benefit analysis as to bring it in-house. I, I'm, I'm sure there are processes and procedures in place around procurement and, genu and governance um, procedures to take account of that within each college. But we don't know for sure. I, I, and speaking on behalf of the sector, I'm sure there are pr processes and procedures in place for all these things, absolutely. Now, the people that have been uh, given voluntary severance, are any of them being re-employed back into the sector? I personally don't have that information to hand. Um, we... we we don't have um, any information across the sector on how many people um, who have taken voluntary severance, perhaps from one college, um, are in another or working elsewhere in the public sector. There'd usually be rules against um, it being re-employment in the same college, but there are, I think there are people who might have left one part of the public sector and are working elsewhere. We don't have um, any information on that. I'm concerned that we're following perhaps the same process that some councils follow, where they give voluntary severance and bring the person back as a consultant or whatever? Well, within the same college, that would be very unusual, and I think most of the voluntary severance schemes would, would specifically preclude that. But, but there are, I, I'm aware of cases where people have taken voluntary severance and, and work elsewhere, you know, in the college sector, um, but not in the same, well, not in the same college, you know, doing the, coming back to do the same job as you've suggested. Is it possible to quantify that? I, I, can, I can undertake to find what information we have on it. Um, Useful to have. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, obviously, there's a concern about uh, the uh, national bargaining. Now, originally, back in 2016, College of Scotland estimated £80 million. Pounds. Now that's gone up to £117 million. Why is that? Uh, when we did the £80 million mm. estimate back in 2016, at that point in national bargaining, it was very early stages of negotiation. And um, we did a best estimate um, with the information we had at the time. Between that submission and the spending review and where we are currently, there is much more of the agreements have been um, agreed. So there's elements agreed and therefore can be costed at a much greater level of detail. And um, that's where we find ourselves with a very uh, detailed um, costing of national bargaining down to a college level, actually sometimes down to FTE within colleges. But it's not a concluded process because not all the parts of um, national bargaining have been fully agreed. So it's our, our best position at the moment, although that figure we've been there or thereabouts for the for the last three, four months. I mean, obviously, you're talking about 117 million over the first yes. three years with a recurring yes. annual cost of 50 million, which is a fairly substantial increase. It does indeed. Um, the Scottish Government obviously provides the bulk of the funding to the college sector. Has any part of the national bargaining been factored into the budget process? Um, yes, certainly. My understanding is, and uh, Dr Kent may wish to confirm this, that the budgets that have been made available for this financial year will allow uh, the payments to be made that have been agreed to date. But of course, in terms of future years, um, we're aware that there are cost implications of national bargaining, as you would expect. We will be working closely with the Funding Council and Colleges Scotland to scrutinise mm -hmm. um, in, in real detail um, the figures and the estimates that are provided. And the future budget settlement will be, um, will be set in light of the conclusions that are reached. But, as it, but, but to be clear, the figures that we've uh, had from uh, Colleges Scotland, as I think 
uh, Shona Struthers recognises, are not yet the final position and are still subject to that uh, further scrutiny from both the Funding Council and the Scottish Government. Now, you're saying that effectively you've already covered part of the national bargaining, which I believe is something to do with the lecturer's yeah. settlement. How much was that in value? And, do, and w does that come off this uh, figure of £117 million? I'll pass over to Dr Kemp, see if he's got the precise figures. Yeah, um, uh, the, there's about £44 million, um of the, the, the £117 um, which is accounted for by what has already been agreed in the lecturer's pay scale. So that is covered? Yeah, that's covered. Now, that's... So that's the three-year figure. Um, mm -hmm. The figure for 2016, or 2017, 18, um, has been covered as well. That that was part of, um, in part, that was covered by uh, an increase in funding to colleges, which was intended for financial pressures, including pay, um, which we allocated to colleges provisionally in the spring, in the light of the eventual deal. Once we knew exactly what the cost would be in each college. We then we'd held some money back in reserve, knowing that the, the because the pay impacts differently on different colleges because it's a harmonisation deal, and some colleges are near what will be the top of the scale, and some are far away from it. The costs in each college vary quite a bit, so it's not a flat rate. Give give every college X percent, and that meets the deal. We'd held back some money, and um, knowing that the the pay deal would be asymmetric in that way. And we've now allocated that to colleges, so there is sufficient in the 2017-18 budget to meet the costs of the, the lecturer's pay deal, which is the bit that has been agreed at the moment. From what you're saying, you've accepted the figure of £117 million over the next three years as being a reasonable estimate. Yes, and I'd, I would clarify, I'm, I'm glad you used the word reasonable estimate there. Um, th there are elements of that £117 million where we still don't know exactly what it would cost. We know about the lecturer's pay deal, that has been agreed. There are discussions ongoing about lecturers' terms and conditions and working hours, which will have a financial impact. And then there is a process to be gone through for support staff and involving job evaluation, where you know we have put an estimate in that 117, which we think is robust, but there is a process to be gone through there, which could produce a slightly different figure. Um, so it is, a, we think, a robust estimate that we have worked with Ecology Scotland and the government on, but there, I would stress there are elements of you know, that are still to be negotiated um, with the staff over that time that we can't be precise about this time. Just, just to be clear on this, the 117 million over the three years you've, you've said 44 million of that is effectively covered. If we're looking at the recurring additional cost of 50, and, it, and I accept it's still an estimate, yeah. what proportion of that will be covered going forward? Well, that would be a, an issue for the, the current spending review. Um, we we have our budgets um, you know, at the moment for 17-18. There is a spending review going on with government, and part of the purpose of being so precise about these estimates at this stage is to feed that into the process, so that the government is aware mm. of the potential costs um, you know, as it decides on budgets in future years. But just to, just to be clear, um, the 44 million is a a recurring cost, a recurring yeah. payment to the colleges. It's yeah. not just a one-off to get them through well, this. Well, just to, be, to clarify, the forty-four million is the element of the pay deal which has now been agreed, and we can forecast very clearly for seventeen eighteen. That money is in and the budget. And that's budgeted. Yeah, that's yeah, in there. Yeah. For the for the years beyond that, we await the spending review. Um, but that bit is absolutely you know, fairly cast out, and we know what it will. I'm cost. just trying to understand, get my head around yeah. what the liability, potential liability would be, mm -hmm. uh, because what we're seeing is what you're saying is that the the uh, projected liability is reducing as the Scottish government has funded part of that. Yeah. Therefore, it's not such a cliffhanger, and you know. Yes, I mean, and, and, and that's a very fair point. That you know, as if, if the government funds um, this pay deal, and you and you know. Uh, I would again caveat it, they can't be absolutely precise about the cost, then there isn't an issue for the colleges. If that funding isn't there, there is. Thank you. Okay, thank you. William Kerr. Thank you, good morning. Uh, I'd like to start with a question to Shona Struthers, if I may. Um, just your statement that you put in uh, is extremely interesting. Uh, you talk about the unprecedented level of cuts. Uh, you talk about the uh, figures picked up by Audit Scotland, uh, and you conclude by saying the overall financial position that the sector faces is unsustainable. Uh, 
is there an inevitability shown us others about where this might go or can this position be wound back from do you believe well hopefully my opening statement laid out a, a very good case for the college sector they're absolutely integral to how our economy runs um, they play an important part uh, not only in the economy but in society and for our for not just for our young people but actually for all learners so colleges absolutely have a place in our society um, Colleges are now part of the public sector, and, and with that, uh, there, are, there are responsibilities. So what we would like to see is a college sector that is um, funded adequately and that has a, a future that's a sustainable funding model. Um, what we are trying to draw attention to are, are some of the issues that, if they're not addressed, um, would leave us all uh, in a very perilous situation. So it, it, it's our job to make sure that um, colleges are valued and recognised, and, and that's what I hope by highlighting these issues we're doing. Thank you. Uh, you talked a bit about funding, and I'd like to ask the Scottish Government, just so I'm clear how this works, uh, at least in relation to some of the areas, the structure of the funding stream goes the Scottish Government to the SFC to a regional body to various colleges within that region. Am I roughly correct? Yes, that's correct. Certainly, if I can speak first of all for the way in which this is dealt with the Scottish Government, um, the entirety of the budget for colleges that is um, agreed by Parliament is passed to the Scottish Funding Council alongside um, a, a very detailed letter of guidance that provides, um, a, a, sets out expectations for the way in which that funding is deployed. And as you correctly say, in three regions, um, in Glasgow, Highlands and Lanarkshire, there is an arrangement where there is a, a regional strategic body mm -hmm. that, of, of three different kinds. Uh, and the funding, it, it, those regional bodies each have a board and uh, with presumably some kind of chief executive, a finance director, and then each individual college sitting underneath will have a board and senior staff. It's slightly correct? more complicated than that. In the case of Glasgow, there mm -hmm. is a, a body, um, the Glasgow Colleges Regional Board, um, which has a small staff and its own board. In the case of um, the Highlands and Islands, the, the regional strategic body is the University of the Highlands and Islands. So I mean, the, the support structure within that is essentially part of the university. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Lanarkshire, the, the regional strategic body is a, an entity called the Lanarkshire Board, which is, in essence, um, New College Lanarkshire. So there, there isn't a, a separate body in Lanarkshire or the Highlands. There is in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. It is complex. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but... Given that, given that structure, uh, given the staffing issues that Colin Beattie was looking at earlier on, given the national bargaining issue that's coming up, what is the Scottish Government's view of a 20% pay rise to the Executive Director of the Glasgow Region Board? Well, the Scottish Government has been liaising with the Funding Council on that matter. Um, it, Scottish Government is concerned to hear about particular bodies um, that are awarding uh, pay increases, which seem to be well in excess of what would be expected um, in terms of uh, public sector arrangements, um, and has discussed that matter with the Scottish Funding Council, which is the body with the direct powers um, in relation to the regional board. Um, my understanding is the matter is not yet fully concluded, but Dr Kemp may wish to say more about it. Um, we were made aware by um, the GCRB some time ago that they were um, contemplating um, changing the salaries to the senior staff, um, largely as a result of taking on um, a finance director um, and, and restructuring the organisation because of that. Um, and they were, they'd been dis in discussion with us for some time about these salaries. Um, and initially it had been a far higher salary rise they were proposing. And we made it clear that we, could, we couldn't really see the case um, at all um, for this rise. Um, they, 
they had the posts evaluated, they took it to their nominations and remunerations committee. When they shared with us the recommendation of that nomination and remunerations committee, I, I wrote to the chair and asked that um, my letter be shared with the board, making it clear the, the factors that they should take into account in deciding this, and also making clear my view um, that you know, such a rise was very hard to justify in the current climate. Um, unusually, um, I have a power to direct um, GCRB on its staffing. For most colleges or universities, this would be a decision which they would take entirely on their own, and I wouldn't have a power to direct. Um, in my discussions with GCRB, I did consider extremely carefully whether I should use that power of direction, which, in my view, is something you should use in extremis and, you know, where you feel a, you know, a, a decision, uh, where you feel there has been a, you know, a, a serious failure on part of the organisation. I, in this case, um, I said to GCRB that I did not intend to, um, at this stage to use the power of direction because my view was that the GCRB is fairly recently appointed, be, re, fairly recently been given its you know, full powers um, of um, actually spending the money in Glasgow. Um, and as a res before doing that, we spent quite a lot of time going through a governance checklist with them and assuring ourselves that their governance and procedures um, were robust. And we are assured that they were robust. Uh, we are assured they are robust. Um, and so in that context, um, I, I decided that it would be inappropriate um, for me to use the powers of directions at that stage. So I, I wrote to them, making it clear I'd considered using the power of direction making it clear that I didn't think the rise was justified, but recognising this was a decision for the board. Um, the board took the decision, to, they, they slightly amended the um, recommendation from their nomination and remuneration committee, and the, the, the sum that was um, eventually awarded was a bit less than was reported in the Herald. Um, however, it was you know, fairly close to it. Um, and my view remains that that is quite hard to justify in the current climate. Uh, but didn't the previous post holder get a 15% give or take pay rise? There, there's, there hasn't been a directly equivalent previous post holder. The, the, the current structure of GCRB um, with its executive director um, has only existed in really in that form. There's only been one post holder. Prior to the, the, the formal creation of GCRB, um, there was... Um, in the kind of interim period before it had full powers, there was a different structure where there was a, a, a clerk to the board who had a, a, a salary rise, I believe. But that, that was a fairly different structure. That wasn't the same post holder. A salary rise of about 15%, I think. Uh, I, I don't have in front of me the, the exact salary rise at that time. Right. Uh, and I think the previous year, the chair may have had, give or take, about a 30% pay rise. The chair of... The, the chair of GCRB? Um, I, I, th I suspect that that might be additional daily rates related to national bargaining, if, if there had been such a rise. So there was no rise as such in the... So there's a day rate paid for chairs of, of regional boards. Um, and the then chair of GCRB was investing a lot of time on national business in relation to national bargaining um, and was submitting claims for additional days. Um, so on top of the regional contribution that she was making, um, she did submit claims for additional days um, for the national contribution that she was making on behalf of the Employers Association. I don't have the detail in front of me in relation to how much those claims were, um, so I can't comment on the extent of, of those claims. You see, that, that's where I'm going, as I'm sure you've worked out, Eileen. The, um, the you talk about a contribution, and my concern is here that we have a number of different strata, a number of different levels, administering funding at great cost to the public purse. Uh, and I note that the interim chair at GCRB says that the pay rise that we were talking about will enhance college education and generate cost savings that will benefit students. How? Well, you would have to direct that question to the interim chair of GCRB. I mean, I think, as you know, as my colleagues have both said, um, we have we have concerns about the you know the you know the the conclusion that the board has reached in relation to this salary increase. 
acted on those concerns? Who's regulating this relationship? Well, um, I think John Kemp explained the action that he has taken. So he has written, uh, he has, you know, he has discussed this with um, with the previous chair and the, and the current incumbent of GCRB. He has written once, or uh, 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 there'd been various correspondence with the chairs, but I did write immediately before the, the board took this decision, making my view very clear. Um, since then, the, the board has taken a decision. Um, the, the chair has written to me explaining that decision, and you're quoting you know, parts of the, um, the explanation, which was also given publicly, um, and I need to decide what I do next. But um, I would stress my, my view um, prior to the, the board meeting was that because we were satisfied with the, the government's arrangements at City, at that GCRB, that it was appropriate that we allow the board to take this decision and not use the power of direction. That said, I do not agree with their decision. So if I can just ask, what, in your view, uh, perhaps in the Scottish government's view, uh, what is the value add? of the regional bodies. If, if, if we have the Scottish Funding Council distributing money, what is the value add of having a regional body to do effectively the job that uh, the Scottish Funding Council does? Well, I can certainly answer that. And this is part of the uh, arrangement that, the, that Parliament clearly approved when uh, going through college reform. So the regional body, yes, is responsible for, um, for funding the colleges within the region. But beyond that is really has overall responsibility for the strategy that is going to be pursued by the colleges across the city, trying to ensure that there's real alignment between what the colleges are offering and what the skills needs of the city are. So it's a body specifically there to ensure that there is a clear offer from the uh, combined group of colleges that will meet the needs of the region and ultimately will be to the advantage of Scotland's economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't the principals of the colleges who know the colleges inside out individually just speculating, be better placed to do that exercise? The principals are all absolutely involved in the work of the regional board. So the regional board serves to bring them together and to ensure there's that um, coherent um, overall strategy that's pursued by the, the colleges in the regions um, in the interests of um, skills development and uh, ultimately economic growth. Uh, finally, then, you, you talked, uh, Paul Johnson, about um, this was what this was the structure that Parliament approved when uh, the college sector was going through reform. We've heard right at the start from Shona Struthers that there are there are some challenges ahead, uh, and there are some things that need to be done. Is it now time for the Scottish government to review the structure that was put in place a number of years ago, and say what may be required here is fundamental reform? Well, what we are certainly committed to do is to ensure that there's continued improvement in the system. And uh, we're conscious, very aware, and we've discussed in front of this committee before, some of the governance issues that have arisen. And in response to that, we have had a, a group uh, doing work on good college governance, uh, which continues to operate in order to ensure continued uh, progress with the governance arrangements, which of course will be uh, considered by the Auditor General. So I agree that there's a need to ensure that the governance arrangements are kept under review and are as effective as possible. I don't, um, I don't think there's any evidence that I have seen which suggests it's a fundamental overhaul of the arrangements, rather it's about continued improvement. Could I just say that there was a very fundamental review of the college sector you know, just a few years ago, and the structural changes you know, affected almost every part of the sector um, uh, through a series of mergers to create regional colleges. And you know, even in Glasgow, which you know, pre-merger had about seven colleges and down to three. So there has been a very fundamental reform in the college sector. I think it's incumbent on all of us to continually review what, what needs to be changed. But I think uh, the argument for a, another fundamental reform right now would need to be balanced against the need for some stability in the sector as they go through the kind of very challenging period that you know, I think we've outlined in our opening submissions where you're know, settling down and dealing with national bargaining and dealing with some of the changes that affect learners as, as part of the learner journey 
are probably more important than another structural reform at this stage. But that said, we need to make sure that we are operating as efficiently as possible and that you know, bodies like GCRB provide good value for money. Okay, Liam Kerr. Uh, just uh, on that then, so is that a guarantee from the Scottish Government that the continued improvement process uh, will result in a sector that is sustainable, contrary to what Shona Struthers is concerned about. Uh, and secondly, is there a view, Dr Kemp, uh, you, you talked there about the student experience. Um, do you take any view on whether the region boards, as an extra tier, absorbing money for whatever product they're putting out, could negatively impact on that student experience, perhaps in the case of national bargaining, perhaps in the case of the actual students, perhaps in the case of assets? Well, shall I answer the first part of the question, which is to affirm that the Scottish Government is absolutely committed to securing the success of Scotland's colleges and to seeing a college sector that flourishes. If I can quote just one sentence from our most recent letter of guidance to the Funding Council, it says, colleges are at the centre of our efforts to build the workforce Scotland's employers and economy needs. And I think that captures uh, the commitment that government has to this sector. Yeah. And in response to your question about student experience and the, you know, the value added. In, in the perfect world, um, every penny would be spent at the chalk face um, on student experience, on teachers and so on. But there does need to be a level of administration um, to ensure that the, you know, the colleges serving Glasgow and the way that Paul suggested operate to a coherent strategy. They aren't competing with each other. They have they, they add up to, a, you know, something that is greater than the, the sum of the parts. And that does need some degree of administration um, which can pull that together. So um, that needs to be done in a way that's cost effective um, and actually meets the needs of Glasgow. But there will always be some cost to it. So it, while it's easy to say that you know, every penny spent on administration isn't being spent in the classroom, you do need to balance the two things. We need to do it effectively. Alex Neal. Can I just stay on this Glasgow Regional Board uh, pay rise to begin with, uh, please? Uh, John, you said that um, the final recommendation of the remuneration committee of the board is a figure close to 20%. How close to 20%? Um, as I understand it, the range, well, uh, the, the range, they were looking at a range for that post between 95 and 98,000. They settled on 95, um, which was an increase from 81. Right. So it's still a very, very substantial increase. Yes. And that's and, and is that the decision they have taken or are waiting on your final decision? Um, in my um, letter to them prior to their board meeting, I said I did not intend to use the power of direction um, at this time. So they are not waiting on final sign-off from me. However, um, at following the board meeting, I did ask them to, after the board meeting to write um, and let me know um, what the decision was, which they did, I think, the day after the board meeting. That was in the middle of last week that I got the letter. I have not responded to that letter yet. Just to be clear, do you still reserve the right to exercise your powers? Um, I made it fairly clear in my letter that I wouldn't exercise those powers. Um, it, at the, at that, I said at that time and subject to them not being above the, um, the, the range that they'd set. However, what I do want to look at is, you know, I'd, I'd ask them to take on board um, a range of um, some information on the com comparators and so on. And I want to assure myself they've done that. But, but if they have, let's stress, you know, this is a decision I don't agree with, but it was properly taken. So here we are, still in a year when we're telling nurses that they get 1%, and we're talking about a nearly 20% rise for somebody who's already on a very substantial salary, uh, which you clearly have indicated that you don't agree with. Why are you not using your powers? I mean, we've, we've seen what happened over the Coat Bridge College, uh, which was about a, a, a leaving package, but... You know, the public are really getting pretty fed up and the people in the nurses, for example, who are paid, you know, about one third of this chief executive's current salary in some cases, uh, their taxes are funding these increases. 
Why are you not using your powers to set an example? If you don't use your powers, you're sending out the wrong message to the rest of the college sector about these excessive pay rises. Yes, I mean, and, and I let's be clear, I did consider very carefully whether I should, and actually, well, the, 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 the easy route would have been to use my powers, would have been to say to a body that is responsible for spending £82 million worth of, of our spending on Glasgow, um, that I do not trust you and your board to make a decision on the difference between 81 thousand and ninety five thousand and I, I did consider that because I, I do not agree that there is a rationale for the change to the salary I did consider very carefully whether I should do that but my view was that I had confidence in the governance of GCRB I have to say I my anticipation was that after having seen my letter and considered all the facts it was unlikely they would take the decision um, to increase the salary I'm disappointed they have um, but my view was that it would be inconsistent of me to trust them with 82 million, but not with you know, the, the difference between these two salaries. That, 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 that was my thought process. I have to say, if they go ahead with this, I wouldn't trust their judgment, because clearly um, to do that in the current climate is absolutely beyond belief. And I think, convener, we should invite in the chair of the board, the chief executive of the board, and the chair of the remuneration committee, because I think we should express our opinion on behalf of the long-suffering public, mm. many of whom are very low paid, having to fund increases of this amount when the general increase limit is about 1%. I just think it's outrageous, and I think it's outrageous that you're not using your powers, quite frankly. Mm. We'll certainly consider that when we take forward our work programme, but I wonder whether I could just ask a supplementary question. Um, Dr Kemp, did you at any point in arriving at your decision consult with the Scottish Government, and what was the discussion? Um, yes, I did consult with the Government. I made them aware that this was happening, and I, I also consulted widely with colleagues. And could I ask with the advice from the Scottish Government? I'll just see my colleague, Aileen, could address Aileen. that. Um, Thank you. So, Mr Kemp and I discussed this matter um, in relation to the, the letter that he was sending out um, and I reminded um, Mr Kemp of public sector pay policy and expectations um, that we have in relation to pay restraint, um, both in relation to um, the funding climate but equally in relation to um, chief executive salaries where um, when we are recruiting a new chief executive of a public body our, our expectation is that the salary decreases um, by a set percentage. Um, so we offered um, some comment on the letter that um, Mr Kemp wrote to, um, to the board um, and we were absolutely supportive of, of his position that um, we should make it clear that this was a matter that the board should consider very carefully um, because it was very hard to justify um, given, the, you know, given the current financial situation um, that you know, the, the college sector in, in entirety but equally the, the public sector faces just now. And that, so, in essence, you agreed with Dr Kemp's actions not to use the powers of direction? At that stage, absolutely. Okay. Um, I was okay. reassured by Mr Kemp's um, expectation that the board would um, would take sufficient cognizance okay. of his letter um, oh. to make the right decision. OK, given that they haven't and given what you've already heard from colleagues around the table about and you yourself have, have mentioned about public sector pay constraints, um, do you regret now not suggesting that those powers of, of direction were used? Well, I think we remain in, you know, in, in close dialogue with the Funding Council about next steps. And as Mr Kemba said, um, you know, the... He has yet to respond to um, to the formal letter from the chair, um, and and you know John's thoughtful about what his response will be. So we will continue to engage in dialogue with the funding council about that. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just Alex, a yeah. clarification in the government position, Eileen. Uh, obviously, the government supported the position when John Kemp said he wouldn't exercise his uh, powers at that time, but um, in the government's view. Uh, there is still time to exercise the power. John has made clear that you know I, I think we would want to clearly 
powers of direction are there um, to be used in extremis, and I think we just want we, we all want to be very thoughtful about you know ab about where and when we would utilise such powers. Um, so I will repeat, we are in close dialogue with with the funding council about appropriate next steps, um, and you know and, and we will be very thoughtful about what what the right next Please step is. Please, my question: using the power is still an option. In my letter, no, no, I mean, it's a government position. Yeah. Using the, the power, power is the still power an option. The power of direction lies with the funding council. It but it's still an option. As, uh, I, in the government's be, view, is it still an option? Yes or no? I, th I, I, I imagine it must be. I mean, I think John has written to exactly. say that he didn't yeah. intend, but as you say, at that time to utilise his yeah. power of direction. Now, now, John, as Aileen said, you know, this power is for in extremis. I would suggest that this is in extremis. I think there'll be public outrage if this goes ahead, and deservedly so. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't disagree with you on that point. Um, the board has taken a decision that I disagree with. I think everyone around this table disagrees with. Um, I need to consider what we do next. I did, and, and, but I stick by the point, and as I said in the letter, I did not intend to use the power because um, I was satisfied with their overall governance. And, you know, subject to them not um, exceeding the, the amount that they'd, they'd already looked at. I need to look at that closely. I, mean, I, I hear what you're saying here, um, but whether the, the option is to use that power or to engage with GCRB um, to, uh, in the light of what you have said and what you know, others have said you know, since the decision was made, the, the, the power that I, I have to set or, or not set um, salaries, I don't think should be used lightly. And in most cases, um, if you are setting up a separate structure to take decisions, there will be times when they take decisions that I don't agree with, that the government doesn't agree with. And if the structure was that all decisions were taken by me or the government, you wouldn't have set up a structure that allowed that. No, to but take it's not place. just about the structure. Well, let me finish. Sorry, Chair. Wait, it's not just about the structure. There is a very clear, as Aileen said, there is a very, very clear public sector pay policy and that public sector pay policy uh, doesn't allow for and doesn't um, promote um, excessive pay rises particularly for people at the top end well the people the rest of the public sector are confined to one percent including low paid public sector workers uh, over twenty one thousand pounds are still pretty low paid compared to this person yeah. so you have to implement, surely, the Scottish Government's pay policy. Uh, and it's very, very clear the pay policy is designed to try to be fair. And it would be very unfair if somebody got a 20% rise when you're against it, you recognise the unfairness of it. Presumably, your funding council recognises the unfairness of it. Scottish Government clearly recognises the unfairness of it. Um, so. This is an extremist. This is just making a mockery of the pay policy. Well, can I say, from the, a government perspective, we will take this issue and ensure that there are further early discussions with the Funding Council um, about the most appropriate way to proceed and we'll ensure that this committee is uh, kept fully up to date in terms of where we get to. We will absolutely uh, consider carefully all that has been said on this issue. Yeah, I, th I think that's very helpful. I couldn't agree more with Alex Neil, but, but I would also point out that it strikes me, based on your responses, that the Scottish Funding Council have acted consistently with the advice they've given from the Scottish Government, and perhaps you would both go away and reflect, and I think yeah. that is helpful that that will be done. Um, sorry. Can I move on to another lines ah. of questioning on separate okay. issues? Can, can I ask, we, we shorten our questions right, and our right. responses okay. to get everybody in. Just going back to the general issue of the national pay bargain and the, and the costs of it, can I first of all clarify the cost estimates, the, the £117 million, um, Given that the government has, since that figure was published, indicated that from next year, certainly, the pay cap will be lifted, does the £170 million figure include any additional cost arising from the lifting of the pay cap? No, 
The £117 million pounds figure is the, the cost of the harmonisation and the implementation right. of national bargaining. It doesn't include any cost of living increases over that period. So any additional cost yeah. arising from the lifting of the cap will be on top of the £117 million. Yes. The second question, I've got three questions in this, the second question, all of them factual, mm -hmm. is that uh, we're saying the £117 million is over the next three years, it's over a three-year period. Yeah. which clearly averages at £39 million pounds per year. But subsequently, uh, it will be an additional estimated £50 million pounds a year. Now, clearly, there's an £11 million pounds a year difference between 39 and 50. So it seems to be a hell of a big percentage jump in the fourth year. Why is that? Um, the, the way it works... Well, I've been shown I might yeah. want to come in. It's about the, the way... It, the, that's the... The, the implementation period of, in the case of the lecturers, um, they're moving all towards the new pay scale over three years in, you know, in, in several tranches over that time, so that it, you know, it, it doesn't leap up to the, the final amount in year one. And in the case of the support staff, um, because in year one of that, the, the job evaluation will not have been done, there are no costs. So that fa you know, that's phased in um, throughout that period as well. So. Yeah. It, it, Have you any indication? 117 million over the three years. What is it in year one, year two, year three? If you don't have it ready to hand, yeah. you can send it to us. We but can. we can. It'd be yeah. useful to see that you know, and therefore it wouldn't be an excessive jump in year four. It is, it is just a phasing issue. And, and for lectures, for example, year one is 25%, 25%, and by yeah. year three it's 50 So there's a phasing. And for right. support staff, yeah. it's next year before the job evaluation is looking to uh, be started. So again, it's a back-end yeah. uh, loading. And can, just to clarify, when you're saying over the three-year period, is is this the year one or is next year this year one? This is year one, 17, yeah. 18. One. Right. Yeah. And we've heard from the Scottish Government that this year's rise has been fully funded. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I know it's maybe asking too early before the budget for next year, but clearly uh, to fully fund next year, uh, have you at the moment any estimate of how much would be required additional money into the college sector if the government was to fully fund that rise next year? that gets into the territory yeah. of the further yeah. scrutiny uh, and work that we need yeah. to do together on these figures to ensure ball, that ball we ball in ball. government... I, I, so I cannot give a figure yeah. to the committee right. today. OK, fine. Thank okay. you. Bill Bowman, who's been waiting patiently. Thank you, convener. I think some of the um, items may have been covered. So that's one uh, well, one part. Is it, I don't know if it's encouraging or not to know that we still act on expectations, but... Uh, Anyhow, when you gave your opening um, statements, um, my impression was that everything is going swimmingly except for the money, and we've dealt with some of this in terms of the, um, the national bargaining and the you know, sustainability of the um, current operations of the, of the colleges and in the colleges' submission that's quite you know, clearly set out. So if I can turn to a, slightly, a different aspect and the long-suffering um, students under the capital investment section that you, that you, you gave us, um, talking about the condition of the college estate as variable and you know, some campuses in a very poor state of repair and require urgent attention and you know, there's clearly investment needed. I mean, who and what or how is this being dealt with? The as, as is mentioned in the Auditor General support, um, the, there is a condition survey um, being carried out, uh, or has been carried out um, in the college sector. That um, condition survey re reported to us um, in the summer. Um, we are in the process of beginning validation of individual you know, campus figures with, with colleges, but the overall figure will feed into the spending review. Um, so. That um, is the first time we've done um, a major estate survey for several years, in part because many of the, the college's estates had been renewed fairly recently. There are quite a number of um, you know, large new estates projects that have just come on stream, but there are still some bits of the college sector estate that have not been touched by that. And this survey looks at the cost of bringing these up to you know, various standards, um, and that will be fed into the spending review. Say, or it's yeah. said in the submission that some are in a very poor state of repair and require urgent attention. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. urgent would suggest that you should be doing something now? 
Yes, and, and, and that's why we're feeding it into the spending review. Yeah. But that sounds like a process that could take some time. I mean, urgent. Yeah. Our, our, I mean, the capital funding we have is fully utilised. It's out with the colleges. The, what this estate survey does is indicate what's needed over the next few years, and, and that will be fed into the spending review. So some students are suffering? Uh, <laughs> Disadvantage, however you want to call it. There is a variety of different levels of estate in the college. There are some very um, new buildings which have excellent facilities, and there are bits where that isn't the case, and those need to be dealt with. Need. I mean, it doesn't sound that something is going to happen for this year. People are going back to college now. Well, there are, well, to take one example, um, one of the um, the state projects that's been identified in, in recent years is the um, Falkirk campus of Forth Valley College. You know, there is a project ongoing there, which will be, in, if it's not in the ground already, will be in the ground soon, building a new campus in Falkirk. So there is an ongoing program of um, looking at campuses of, of repairs and replacements where necessary. Um, what this future-looking um, estate condition survey does is look at where we go next with that um, program. But there are things already ongoing. You know, City of Glasgow's um, Cathedral Street campus opened quite recently. Um, the, there was a new campus opened in Kilmarnock. Um, as I say, Falkirk is being worked on. There is a program ongoing, but there is more to be done. Could this be amended to say are in a very poor state of repair and are receiving urgent attention? Well, yeah, well, yes, well, some of them are, but clearly not all of them in the future because we, we need to feed that into the spending review and, and work out plans for those. When might that be? Well, the spending review is ongoing at the moment and we will hear later within months. Yes, absolutely. If I could just say very briefly, if we actually look at the figures for this financial year, Capital investment in the college sector has increased from 20 point four, sorry, increased by 20, more than 20 million to 47.4 million. That includes some of the big projects that Dr. Kemp's referred to and also some of the more routine work that is needed. We will work with the Funding Council on receipt of the detailed estates condition survey and ensure that future decisions on capital funding uh, reflect what that says. Um, I'm, I wonder whether I might just pursue this with slightly further because um, obviously we've seen coverage of buildings being at risk. We would want your assurance that there aren't any buildings that are critical, that are at risk now, that there is money available to deal with those urgent health and safety issues now. That the health and safety of students and those working in colleges is absolutely paramount, and I would want to be—I would wish to give an assurance that should any issues arise that require to be addressed immediately for health and safety reasons, then that will be done. I think that's very helpful. Thank you, Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, I'm delighted, Dr. Kemp, that you mentioned the wonderful Kamara campus. It's an absolutely stunning uh, building, and the students there uh, and the staff really, really enjoy the experience. That they're having there. I wanted to talk about the student experience, the kind of broad student experience as well. And uh, Mr. Johnson, you mentioned, of course, that the whole purpose of the college is to prepare students for the workforce, for employment, and, and for further education. And the satisfaction rates in the Auditor General's reports are quite clear and quite impressive. 90% of students are satisfied with the experience. But also, probably more importantly, 83% go into positive destinations. Now, what I want to ask is do we and how do we track where the students are going within the local economies to work? Because as you probably know, Ayrshire has a particularly difficult problem in terms of overall employment compared to the rest of Scotland. So what I'd like to ask is how do we shape the colleges and what the colleges, the courses that they offer to serve the needs of the local economy? How do we track that? And what's the, the engagement with Skills Development Scotland to try to make sure that the students coming out of Ayrshire College are able to fit in the workplace and the economy in Ayrshire. Well, I wonder if I might just in, um, you know, say a few words before I hand across to the Funding Council. So this absolutely fits with the ambition of, of the, the reform, the, the government's reform agenda, where we create um, new colleges, new colleges of scale um, that are able, better able to um, 
to engage with um, with national agencies like Skills Development Scotland, with national employers like the health service, with universities, with schools, um, with industry to absolutely un better understand the, the needs and opportunities within their region and then refocus their curriculum so that they, they are delivering um, a curriculum that best needs, need, meets the needs of, of the region um, and delivers people who are, you know, employable and you know and, and qualified in, in courses that are absolutely relevant to the needs of the region um, so there's much closer working with skills development school which is really important um, and you know and, and greater scrutiny of the skills investment plans so that that so that that evidential base really underpins um, the the delivery of, of college and you know and that absolutely I think demonstrates the you know the success or you know the, on the journey that we are um, on in relation to the college reform agenda that that, that, that we have John will want to say some more and we well, as you probably know, we fund colleges through outcome agreements. Um, so we have an outcome agreement with Ayrshire College about what it's delivering you know, for its local area. And that is built in part on a regional skills assessment, um, which SDS lead on. Um, and we expect the two things to fit together. So we work closely with SDS on that. Um, with the, um, the conclusion of the Enterprise and Skills Review and the setting up of the new strategic board, one of the work streams of, of that is closer alignment between SFC and SDS. And we are currently uh, you know, exploring how we bring that process um, far closer together so that the, um, you know, how, in, in your case, Ayrshire's need for um, you know, people in college, apprenticeships and all other kinds of provision is, is linked to what your economy needs. Um, something that happens already but we can take it to another stage after the enterprise and skills review by being you know even closer to sds how do, how do we as a committee perhaps or any other committee of the panel get some kind of glimpse of that and where the students end up in terms of the employment within the local economy how do we ever get a, a sense or even to see that or assess that does anybody capture that kind of data we, it, 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 we, we do capture destinations as we've talked about um, earlier however that's six months after graduation um, I think there is a, a piece of work to be done that isn't I think yet done but it's developing where as with the the higher education statistics where we used to have six months um, destination data but didn't really know where people were um, four or five years out there is there's that's been replaced by um, a programme of statistical work where you're tracking people through their um, their tax status and so on, so you know where they work, how much they're earning and so on, so you can relate that back to you know, a, a particular degree. I had a, a very interesting meeting just a couple of weeks ago with SDS about how we track apprentices in the future to know you know what the return is there. You know, at, If they go into a job, how long do they stay and what their, their wages are over several years? And actually, I think that the way forward, and this is you know, completely in the, the, the area of the enterprise and skills review, is that kind of tracking through other data sets, through um, tax, etc., so that you know in five years' time, you know, where somebody, and, and, and in a consistent way, so that you're tracking somebody who's done apprenticeship, somebody who's done a college course, somebody who's done a university course in the same way, so that you know how much they're earning, what kind of um, journey they've had through employment, and, 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 and that would help us make better decisions about where to put our investment, but it would, more to the point, it would help young people or parents deciding what to do know that, you know, five years out after doing that course, you're likely to be to be in you know, a particular destination. That is a piece of work that is very complex, requires all parts of government to work together. It, it is, involves all sorts of permissions and so on. It cannot, we can't click the fingers and do it overnight, but that's the direction we should be aiming. That, that, that would be very, very welcome to see that kind of work because it, it's mm -hmm. all about does is what we do making a difference and can we evidence that? And that would be very useful to see that. Hey, yeah, just a very quick, um, actually this month at the end of September, uh, College of Scotland are launching a piece of work that we've been working on with the Fraser of Allendner Institute and we've actually been looking at the value that college graduates bring to society. So we're, we're launching that at the end of this month and, and that, will, what, that will demonstrate the value of a college education. Super, super, super. Um, to show that I'm not just bleating on about Kilmarnock, convener, um, <laughs> in, our, in our journey at the committee in previous meetings, we, we heard from Lou's uh, Castle and Stornoway, and we, I think the members of the committee were particularly sympathetic about the difficulty that they find in meeting targets year on year, and we compared 
the model applied to Lewes uh, was the same model applied to Edinburgh, perhaps one of the biggest colleges in Scotland. And I wanted to ask if there's any thinking at Scottish Government level to adapt the model to allow Lewes Castle to, to better achieve targets or to modify the targets so that they didn't feel as though they were f being told they were failures every year. That is a matter for the Scottish Funding Council to take yeah. forward, obviously, with support from the Scottish Government, so I'll hand over to yeah. Dr Kenny. And I, I think uh, the Minister had, had written to the committee um, explaining some of the, the ways in which um, Lewes Castle was funded. Um, at, now, Lewes Castle was assigned to UHI, so the decisions about precise levels of funding are now um, matters for UHI. However, um, we are very keen that in the way we fund colleges, we do recognise that you can't fund Edinburgh College the same way you'd fund Lewes Castle or West Island College or Orkney College. That they, you know, they are of different scales. They're serving completely different um, demographies. So we do have a system of funding that has a, a, an additional payment for rural areas. We are currently reviewing that and we'll be consulting quite soon on, on, on where we take it. Now, the old system was based, it, it was a fairly formulaic system based on the rurality of the area and where the students came from and the size of campuses. And, actually, it, it, and it was invented pre-outcome agreements. Now that we have outcome agreements, we're in a position where I think we can sit down with a or in the case of Lewes Castle, it would be UHI that sit down with them and say, we have an outcome agreement that you serve this area. And, and instead of it being based on formulas um, and student number targets that might or not might not be met, you can have a more honest discussion about, oh, this is the number of students you need, but the amount of rurality funding on top will be X. And, and we want to move in that direction where we are more being more clear about what we fund in an area, so that instead of just funding per student, um, you are also you're funding per student, but also agreeing how that college will serve a rural area. Now, there are some colleges in rural areas that actually don't have huge additional costs. Uh, they, they might serve people from rural areas, but if they serve them entirely from a big building in a city where the student comes in, there's not a huge amount of additional cost. There are others like Lewes Castle which necessarily are very small and do have additional costs. And there are others yet again, like West Highland College, which has about 10 campuses spread about the West Highlands, which are all tiny. They all need to be supported in different ways. Um, and so that's what our consultation, which we should be out in the next few weeks, will be doing. Because um, we, we, we do very much recognise um, the points that were made by Lewes Castle when they were in front of you, that it is challenging for a small college um, in an area where you, you're not going to get economies of scale. That's, that's really encouraging, I think, Convener, because we, we don't want to hear that the castles are being continually told they're failing, when in fact they're doing some pretty fantastic and amazing work there that's valued right across the community. So I'm encouraged by that. Thank you. Okay. Um, just on the back of that, the, I mean, I'm conscious the committee receives you know, quite a number of Section 22 reports about colleges from the Auditor General, um, probably more than we receive about anything else, um, although I could stand to be corrected on that. Um, so I wonder, what does this tell us about governance and, and issues of, of financial sustainability? Um, can we learn from this so that we don't need to see quite so many Section 22 reports in future? Um, well, if I could go first, I mean, uh, uh, some of the Section 22s um, that you received last year, not the ones you're considering this term, were very much about governance. Um, and lessons have been learned from that, um, you know, in direct response to the, um, the events at Clyde, which was one of the Section 22s. Um, there was a good governance task group set up, um, and that has done its work. There are areas out for consultation at the moment, which will, you know, further implement that. So lessons have been learned on that governance issue. Um, some of the, the ones this year are slightly different. Some of them do relate to governance, but a lot of them are about financial sustainability. Um, so I, I my, and we are learning the lessons from that as well in how the SFC engages with colleges through an, an internal early warning system, um, you know, to understand you know, where colleges are not meeting targets, where there might be financial issues coming out, the financial returns, where there might be governance issues, so that we are getting onto those earlier, and uh, I hope beginning to tackle some of them before they become Section 22. So, I mean, they are very much part of a learning process, and I hope on the governance ones of a couple of years ago we have learned quite a bit. 
Okay, we look forward to receiving fewer in future. Um, can I move us on to student numbers um, in the time left? Um, the it, Scottish Funding Council, I think, up till 2015, said there was something like 140,000 um, fewer places in, in colleges since 2007, I think the, the figure might be, but again, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, for 2016, the number rose to 152,314. Again, you know, please please tell me if these figures aren't accurate. Um, I'm interested in pursuing because there was some debate in the press about um, the figures used. My understanding is that, you know, in discussions with the Auditor General, actually it's about the start date for when you measure things rather than the accuracy of the figures. Would that be correct? Oh, to be clear, um, and I actually I think the Auditor General explains that in, this, in, in part in the report, um, we, we count figures for all of the colleges we fund and for the funded activity, um, which means that we are using a slightly wider set of colleges than the Auditor General reports on. Um, she reports on the in incorporated colleges, which excludes some in the Highlands. Um, so that's why we have slightly different figures. They are broadly consistent. Um, Ours point to a very slight increase in the number of students, hers point to a very slight decrease. They're broadly flat. Um, and the, the issue is simply that we're counting um, a slightly different set of students because we count a slightly wider set of colleges. Let me, let me stick to the set of students that the Auditor General counts because that's obviously what the committee considers. Um, it did note a decrease, albeit you know, we could argue whether it's slight or not, but full and part-time places fell, 16 to 24 age group in particular, um, numbers fell, um, and I'm wondering whether you've explored the reasons behind those reductions, um, particularly amongst that, that young age group, and whether there's any corrective action that you need to take to address this. Um, the part of the reason for, and I think that, again, it relates to things that the Auditor General has mentioned, there is a demographic change happening and the number of young people um, has been dropping um, for some years in that group. It will begin to increase again because you, you can see it in school populations. Um, but at the moment, it's still on a downward trend and that will have affected um, the, the number of people in that age group in colleges. In addition, um, I think some of the... Um, the imperatives that led to focusing on that age group in the, the period after the, the recession are beginning to go. The, 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 the um, youth employment for young people is growing. In addition, they are staying on at school longer um, and more are going to university. And we've, we look constantly at demog demography and what's happening um, with colleges. The numbers of people leaving um, college at, and, and en or leaving school and entering college at 16 have uh, pretty much halved um, over the last decade, and the number leaving after S6 have, have rocketed. So people are entering, they're leaving school later and entering the tertiary education later, and that's affecting it too. Um, so th there are a whole number of things there which, in, you know, mean that because there are other destinations for young people, the age band has moved up slightly. Um, and that, I think, gives us opportunities to do more um, part-time for older people and focus on a different group in a way that you know we had to prioritise elsewhere in the previous years. We now have an opportunity to do something different. OK, so you anticipate being able to take up the slack by offering courses once again to, to perhaps a slightly older population? Yes. Excellent. That's good news indeed. Um, can I ask, because obviously demand for college places you know, will vary from place to place. You, you don't appear to record that overall level of demand at a national level, or, or, or do you? If I can come in on, on that, uh, that's absolutely a piece of work that is uh, being taken forward at the moment between government and the Funding Council uh, and Colleges Scotland as we actually respond to some of these recommendations from the Auditor General and take forward our work on the learner journey. And that is to look at the merits of a common application process that would give us that overall national picture of demand, which we would, I think, all accept uh, we don't have at this uh, point. And we're presently in uh, a series of consultations uh, with those who, those at college, those who have got particular interest in this, to look at the merits uh, and the potential issues associated with moving to a common application process. OK, that's helpful to know. Are there any other questions from members? Can, can I just ask one? Alex Neal. Um, 
You said that a record level, 41% of uh, all activity in colleges is higher education, and obviously the colleges are extremely successful in improving access for people who are underrepresented in higher education. That just a factual question, 41% of college activity is higher education. What is that as a percentage of total higher education activity in Scotland? Is that about 20%? 20. Yeah. 20. 20. Yeah. Right, good. Is that, right, is that a record level as well? Uh, yeah, I believe it is, actually. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. OK. And, and obviously, that, a lot of those people are from the very people we're targeting with access programmes. Well, yeah. Do we know how many of them actually um, transitioned from college to university? The um, Every year... Um, there is some we we're keen to encourage people to transition to university with advanced standing um, so that they get credit for um, the HNs they've done in colleges mm -hmm. and there's about 4000 each year do that mm -hmm. um, there's another several thousand on top of that who will go into university but will go back to year one sometimes because they've changed direction or doing different courses but often we th we, we think there is room to push that 4000 or so further um, and get more of the, the people who are going to university to go in with advanced standing because as you say it is a it is a very good way of widening access that the demographic makeup of he and colleges is very different from most universities and it offers a route in um, which wouldn't otherwise be there so it's a very valuable route good thanks thank okay. you any further questions no, on that basis, can I thank the witnesses for coming along this morning to give evidence to the committee, um, and we'll now move the committee into private session. <laughs>